In this video, we're going to be looking at a topic called relative velocity. And this is all about measuring the velocity of something relative to different coordinate systems. And in particular, what can happen if the coordinate system is moving. Now this all starts with the idea of a reference frame. And I could draw an x, y, z coordinate system or an x, y coordinate system. And that would be the reference frame that I'm using. And I would have an origin and I could draw a vector and I could measure the position of something. I could measure the velocity of something. I could measure the acceleration of something all relative to the origin of that particular coordinate system or this three dimensional one over there, whichever one I wanna use. But the thing that's been true up until now is all the coordinate systems that we've been using have been stationary. They haven't been allowed to move. So I fix my coordinates somewhere in space and I measure stuff relative to it. But you don't have to have your coordinate system fixed at some point in space. In fact, sometimes it's advantageous to have your coordinate system moving. And so we're going to extend our ideas of velocity and position and displacement and all these things measured relative to coordinate systems that are allowed to move. But we're going to put a constraint. We're only going to allow them to move at constant velocity. That means a uniform speed in a particular direction. We're not going to allow our coordinate system to, to accelerate. Not yet. We'll look later on in the course what happens when you try to measure things from accelerated coordinate systems, and things get a little bit wonky when you do that, so we'll handle that separately. But for now, we're going to just stick to a coordinate system that has a constant velocity. Now, often, most often, that velocity is going to be zero, but sometimes it can be non-zero, but as long as it's constant, it'll work out fine. And by the way, there's a term for that. It's called an inertial reference frame or sometimes an inertial frame of reference. We'll um, learn what that means later on, why it's called that. It's kind of a weird name, inertial. But uh, I just wanted to mention that to you because it's very ingrained in me to say that because that's what we call these kinds of constant velocity reference frames or inertial frames of reference. And so if I use that word, I don't want you to be like, he's never said that word before. What the heck does that mean? So I just am referring to coordinate systems that are moving at constant velocity. Usually velocity is equal to zero, but not always. And so in this video, we're going to look at the not always part. What happens when you have coordinate systems that are moving? Now we're going to start with the simplest kind of relative velocity problem there is, one where everything's moving in a straight line. And so here I have an example of a guy on a train who throws a ball off the train, which is itself moving. And so we want to measure the velocity of the ball. And so how would we say what the velocity of the ball is? Well, to measure the velocity of anything, we need a coordinate system with an origin that we can use as a reference frame. In this picture, there are two obvious places to stick a coordinate system. One, you can fix the coordinate system, that is, glue it to the train, so that the coordinate system is moving with the train. The other possibility is to have the coordinate system fixed to the ground. And so the coordinate system over here in purple is glued to the ground. It's fixed to the ground. It's not moving. It's the kind of coordinate system we've been using all along in this course. This green coordinate system, however, is glued to the train, so it is moving with the train. Now, I have two different velocities here. The big V is the velocity of the train, and the little v is the velocity of the ball. And again, I'm good. I can measure these guys either from the, the coordinate system that's moving with the train, or I can measure them from the coordinate system that's glued to the ground. Let's look at the velocity of the train. What would the velocity of the train be as measured from this green coordinate system? I want you to pause the video and think about that for a minute. See if you can come up with the answer to that. What would be the velocity of this train measured from the green coordinate system that's moving along with the train. Do you see that that would be zero? The train is not moving away from the coordinate system. 
They're both moving together in tandem, so they're not separating. And so this train has no velocity at all relative to the green coordinate system. But it would have a velocity relative to the purple coordinate system, the one that's glued to the ground, because the train is moving away from the purple coordinate system. Now the ball, if we look at the ball, it's moving away from both the green coordinate system and the purple coordinate system. But it's doing so at different rates because the coordinate system in the green, the train coordinate system, is moving with the train. So it's going to measure different positions and different velocities relative to it compared to the purple ground coordinate system. And there is a fundamental relationship between the velocity of the ball as measured from the green train coordinate system and the velocity of the ball is measured from the purple ground coordinate system. And I've written down that mathematical relationship as an equation. Note that these v's stand for velocities and they are vectors. That doesn't matter so much in this problem because everything's going in a straight line, but when we let things move at angles relative to one another, the fact that these guys are vectors is going to be important. So I'm going to leave them in there for now. And so I want to explain this notation, which this all might look very confusing, but the notation is actually really simple. Let me read the equation to you. This is the velocity of the ball relative to the ground. So that slash means relative to the. The velocity of the ball relative to the ground is equal to the velocity of the ball relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. In other words, if this guy on the train that's moving with the train, if he measures the ball, he has a radar gun, he throws the ball, he fires his radar gun, and he measures the velocity of the ball, and he says it's 10 miles an hour. So that 10 miles an hour would be the velocity of the ball as measured from this moving green train coordinate system. Now, if this guy over here on the ground has a radar gun, what would he measure the velocity of the ball as? He would measure that 10 miles an hour, but he would also measure the additional velocity of the train. So let's say this is 10 miles an hour also. So the train's moving 10 miles an hour, and then from the train, the ball is thrown at an additional 10 miles an hour. Obviously, this guy's going to measure 20 miles an hour. But let's see what that looks like in the equation. Again, we have the velocity of the ball measured from the ground. So the velocity of the ball measured over here is going to be the velocity of the ball measured from the train, plus the velocity of the train. Now, when I say velocity of the train, I don't mean the zero measured from the green. I mean the velocity of the train measured from the ground. And that's what this equation tells you. Now, I know this is a lot, but this equation is what you need to be able to come up with. What I have here, the velocity of the ball relative to the ground, that's this fixed coordinate system, is going to be the velocity of the ball relative to my moving coordinate system, plus the velocity of the moving coordinate system. That's what this equation is telling me. And you need to be able to write down this equation. So be able to draw this picture and write down this equation. And the reason I want you to be able to do that is because this equation will be the keys to the kingdom. If you can write down this equation and you know what all its parts mean, I will show you how to use it to solve any crazy relative velocity problem that I might throw at you. If you understand this equation, I'm going to show you how to use it to make even the most complicated, mind-bending relative velocity problems trivially easy. But before we get there to the more complicated problems, let's look at uh, an example of this problem with some numbers thrown in. Okay, here I have, it's the same example, and we have that same equation here, but the example says a person on a train with a relative velocity of 60 miles per hour relative to the ground, so the train is moving at 60 miles an hour relative to the ground. So I can write that as an equation here. The velocity of the train relative to the ground is 60 miles per hour. Now note, I can see that the train is moving in the x direction. So I can make this guy into a vector by putting an x hat here to show the direction. And then I can put a little arrow on top to make that guy a vector. So this is the velocity of the train relative to the ground. 
Now, we're also told in the problem that the baseball is thrown with a speed of 40 miles per hour relative to the train in the same direction. So it's also going in the x hat direction, and it has a speed of 40 miles per hour. And so I can write this down. I can say the velocity of the ball relative to the train is going to be 40 miles per hour in the x hat direction. And now I have the velocity of the ball relative to the train. I have the velocity of the train relative to the ground. I can do my vector addition. So here I have all of that written out for you. Here's our equation. Again, the velocity of the ball relative to the ground equals the velocity of the ball relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. I'm just going to plug in. So under the velocity of the ball relative to the train is 40 miles per hour. The velocity of the train relative to the ground is 60 miles an hour. They're both in the x hat direction, so I can just add these numbers together, and it's what we would expect, 100 miles per hour in the x hat direction. Now, what if we threw the ball in the opposite direction? That is, we have the train going to the right here, and we throw the ball to the left. And if I have my normal x, y coordinate system here, you can see that the ball now is going in the negative x hat direction. So all I have to do is plug that in right there. And so I can say this guy here, this negative 40 miles per hour x hat, that's the velocity of the ball relative to the train. And the velocity of the train relative to the ground, that's this guy here, this 60 miles per hour in the x hat. And when I add these guys together, I get the velocity of the ball is going to be 20 miles per hour in the x hat direction. Now, this is kind of an interesting result. I have the ball being thrown in the negative direction. So the velocity as measured from the train, if I have my coordinate system that is on the train, this ball would be measured having a negative velocity. In fact, it would be negative 40 miles per hour. But measured from the ground coordinate system, it has a positive velocity of positive 20 miles per hour or 20 miles per hour in the positive x hat direction. And so the direction is completely different measured from these two different coordinate systems, even though the motion of the ball itself is the motion of the ball. Where we measure it from and if that coordinate system is moving or not can have a huge impact on what the numbers we use for our calculations. And so it's really important to understand how we measure things relative to different coordinate systems. Next, I want to look at another problem, one that's not much harder, but that's slightly harder because we're going to have things going at different angles. So in the previous example, we had everything moving in a straight line. In other words, everything was moving in one dimension. But if you start allowing things to move in two dimensions or three dimensions, you start adding complexity to the problem. But here's the secret. You can take even the most complicated problem, the most complex problem, and you can make an analogy with that simple example we just did, a ball being thrown off of a train. And we can use that analogy to help us set up the complicated problem so that it's easy to solve. So I've written in this equation here, and we have the velocity of the ball relative to the ground is the velocity of the ball relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. So here's the secret. In every problem that's a relative velocity problem, there's going to be something that is behaving like the ball. And then there's going to be something that's behaving like the train. And then, of course, there'll be something that's like the ground. Now, in the problem, they may call it the earth, or they may call it the shore of the river, or something like that. But it's going to be really obvious what the ground is. And usually they just call it the ground, and that makes life easy. But regardless, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have, there's going to be two things. One of them's like the ball, and one of them's like the train. And you're going to have to figure out which is which. And it doesn't matter whether it's an airplane or a car or a boat or something else that's moving. Something is going to be like the ball and something is going to be like the train. 
And once you have it figured out, you can write down an equation that looks just like this. And so instead of ball, you might have an airplane, or you might have a boat, or something like that. Instead of a train, you might have a river current, or you might have something else that is moving, that has a moving coordinate system. That's Remember, the train is the one that has the moving coordinate system, the one that's glued to it. And so once you figure it out, you can write down an equation that looks just like this. And that will tell you how to draw the picture that you need to work the problem. You know how to draw two vectors added together. We do tail to tip twice. And so once you know how to draw the picture, the, the equation tells you how to draw the picture. And the picture's either going to be a straight line, as it was in the last problem, or it's going to be a triangle. And so you know how to do triangles. You've got your Pythagorean theorem. You have your trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, and all of that jazz. So once you can write down the equation for your problem, it will tell you how to draw the picture. Once you have the picture, it's just a triangle, and you know how to do triangles. So I'm going to show you that with some practical examples, and we're going to look at several different variations of relative velocity problems, and I'm going to show you how to use this analogy, taking whatever problem I throw at you and making an analogy. In other words, what is like the ball? What is like the ground? What is like the train? You're going to write down an equation that is for the parameters of your new problem that looks just like this equation, and you're going to use that equation to draw the picture. Once you've got the picture, it's just a triangle or even just a straight line. And that becomes very trivial, trivial to solve. And so I'm going to show you that starting with some simple examples. But pretty quickly, we're going to ramp up and get some really complicated examples. But you'll see that if the example gets complicated, we can always break it down using this equation and simplify it and make it easy to figure out how to set up and then easy to solve. Okay, here's a simple and straightforward example. And I'm going to show you this analogy approach that I was talking about before, uh, making an analogy between this problem and the most simple problem, the one of the ball being thrown off of the train. Now, let me say before I do that, that you probably would not need to use this analogy technique in order to solve this problem. You wouldn't need to do it because it's such a simple, easy to see problem. The picture is pretty obvious once you start working through it. But I'm taking this simple problem to show you the process of how to set up that analogy. And so we'll be able to see how to set how to use this analogy process to set up a problem, and then we'll be able to use that for more complicated problems that are not so obvious. But I want to say that. This analogy technique that I'm going to be describing is a tool. I'm not saying that you have to use this tool for every problem. I don't care whether you use it or not, because if you can read a problem and you see how to draw the picture and you draw the picture and work the problem correctly, you don't need to use the tool. The tool is just there to help you figure out how to draw the appropriate picture. So once you've drawn the picture, these problems are really easy to solve. So I'm going to show you with this very simple problem that you wouldn't need the tool. I'm going to show you how to do it with the tool just so that we can start to learn how to use the tool. But once you've got it figured out, you can, the tool's like a crutch. If you don't need it, you can throw it away. But use it if you need it to support your work and figure out how to set up the problem. So anyway, let's get started with this one. It says a motorboat has a speed in still water of 10 meters per second. It's crossing a wide river with a strong current of 7 meters per second as shown. So the boat's going across the river, and the river's going perpendicular to that. If the bow of the boat is kept aimed directly across the river, what is the velocity relative to an observer standing on the shore? And so that's going to be our coordinate system on the ground. And so I can draw a coordinate system here. This would be x and this would be y, and that's my ground coordinate system. Now, we could call it the ground coordinate system, or because it says shore in the problem, we're going to call that the shore. So we're going to measure the velocity relative to the shore, but that is also, we could have called it the ground if we wanted, or the earth, or anything we want to, but that's the ground. It's the shore. 
Now we see in the problem, there are two vectors already drawn for us. We have the velocity of the boat relative to the river. And so if there were no current, nothing is moving, and the boat would just go straight across. But because the river has got a current, what's going to happen to the boat? The boat's trying to go straight across, but the river is moving and dragging the boat downstream. And so the river is acting like our train, because we could imagine a coordinate system that's moving with the flow of the river. What does that mean? I could imagine a little piece of water here, a little volume of water that's moving to the right. And I could glue a coordinate system on that little piece of water that is moving to the right, and that would be the river coordinate system. And so I could draw that in as the river coordinate system, and I could measure the velocity of my boat relative to the fixed coordinate system on the shore, or I could measure it with the moving coordinate system that's moving along with the river. Now, how would the velocity of the boat be measured relative to this coordinate system with the river that's moving with the river? So the boat is moving to the right, the coordinate system is moving to the right. So measured from this river coordinate system, the boat is just going to go straight across. It's going to go straight across this way because they're both moving downstream together. Can you see that that's like the train? This is like the train. Now the one here, this is the shore, I could also measure the boat relative to the shore. And what's that going to do? It's going to be going across this way, but because the river is dragging it downstream relative to the shore, someone standing on the shore is going to see it go off at an angle. And so that's what we have to figure out. We want to be able to draw the correct picture that corresponds to this problem. So what I've done is I've got my picture here of my velocity of the boat relative to the river. We know it's going straight across. We know the river is going straight to the right. And so these guys are no longer in a straight line. They're actually at a right angle to one another. And I want to write down the appropriate equation that will let me draw the picture. And so what I'm going to do is I've sketched back my uh, train problem with the coordinate system on the train and the coordinate system on the ground. And I've got my equation, which I just told you a minute ago, you need to learn how to just draw this picture and, and write this out. You do it a few times, it'll become second nature, I promise. But I've got the velocity of the ball relative to the ground, the velocity of the ball relative to the train, plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. What are these things in this problem? Well, I think it should be clear that the river is like the train because the train is moving and the river is moving. The coordinate system that's glued to the river is moving with the river, just like the coordinate system that's moving with the train is moving like the train. So I know the shore is going to be like the ground. I think that's pretty obvious. The river is like the train. So that means that the boat has to be like the ball. And so the boat is our ball. Anywhere I have a B for ball, I'm going to just let that be a B for boat. Anywhere I have a T for train, I'm going to write an R and let that be for the river. And anywhere I have a G, I'm going to write that as an S for shore. And so that lets me write down an equivalent problem, or an equivalent equation rather, that is the equation that describes the situation I have over here on the left with my boat and my river. And so I can now say the velocity of the boat relative to the shore, and this is what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. It's equal to the velocity of the boat relative to the river plus the velocity of the river relative to the shore. And so what that tells me to do is I've got this is the velocity of the boat relative to the river. And over here, I've got the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. The answer that I want is simply the sum of those two vectors. So what I need to do is I need to take this guy, connect him over here tail to tip, and draw my tail to tip twice. And then I've drawn the triangle that comes from this picture. So I'm going to have my velocity of my boat relative to the river, 
and I'm going to have my velocity of the river relative to the shore, and I've just taken these two vectors here and connected them tail to tip, and then I'm going to have my sum, which is my tail to tip twice, and that would be the velocity, oops, that would be the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. And that is what I'm looking for in all of these problems. And so I can see that I'm going to have an angle here, and I can just use this picture now to solve for this guy, the one that I'm looking for, the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. So let's look at this. I have my velocity of the river with respect to the shore, which we know is going to the right. I have my velocity of the boat, which is relative to that moving with the river coordinate system, which is going to go straight across. I've connected them tail to tip twice. Why? Because that's what my equation tells me to do. It says make this sum, add this vector to that vector, and that gives me the vector that I want, which is this green vector here. And so this is the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. Now I have this angle theta here, and I've drawn in my north, south, east, west coordinate system here. Uh, we looked at this kind of uh, way of describing vectors way back at the beginning of the class. And so you may want to go back and look at that, that video if, if you're not familiar with that. But very often in these problems, we measure things from the cardinal point of the compass, north, south, east, west, or at various angles to them. And so I wanted to show you how to do that in these kinds of problems just because that's very often the expectation. So I have my equation here, and I've drawn the triangle. And I want to figure out what this green vector is. Now I know the velocity of the boat relative to the river, they tell us in the problem that that's 10 meters per second. The velocity of the river relative to the shore, they tell us in the problem that's 7 meters per second. And so I can use the Pythagorean theorem and get the magnitude of the velocity of the boat relative to the shore. And when I do that, I get that it's 12.2 meters per second. So this guy, if I'm standing on the shore, I would see the boat going away from me at this angle theta at 12.2 meters per second. And what would the angle theta be? It would be the arc tangent of the opposite over the adjacent, the VRS over the VBR. So I take opposite over adjacent, I take the arc tangent, and that tells me that that angle is about 34 degrees. And so if I'm looking at my picture, the boat going straight across lines up with the north, and this angle is going to be to the east of the north. And so that is how I would characterize this angle. So I would say the velocity of the boat relative to the shore is 12.2 meters per second at an angle of 34 degrees east of north. And with that, the problem is solved. Now, before I go into the next problem, I just want to say one last thing. I want to say it again. This picture is how you solve the problem. Once you have the triangle, all the math is really easy. It's easy to figure out. And so many of you could have simply read the problem and said, okay, the boat's trying to go straight across, the river's trying to drag it downstream, so obviously it's going to go off diagonal like this. You could have just drawn the triangle and just worked the problem. You don't have to do, okay, what's the ball, what's the train, all that stuff. You don't have to do it if you don't need it. But if you need it, it can be very helpful to help you figure out what to do. Okay, in this example, we have a, a plane has an airspeed. And what do we mean when we say airspeed? That's the velocity in still air. In other words, the velocity with respect to the air. And so the plane has an airspeed of 200 kilometers per hour. Um, the pilot wants to fly due north, but encounters an eastward wind of 50 kilometers per hour. So the question says, to maintain a northward trajectory, at what angle must the pilot's heading be? This is very different from the last problem. In the last problem, we had the boat was going forward and the wind, or the current in the river, rather, was pushing it aside. This is the same situation. You have a plane that is trying to fly due north, but then there's this wind that is going towards the east, and it's going to push it off course. That's if the pilot does nothing. But what if the pilot makes a correction? The pilot can turn into the wind so that 
he goes due north. But if he does so, how fast will he be going? And what angle does he need to turn into? That's what this is asking. It says, to maintain, oops, to maintain a northward trajectory, at what angle must the pilot's heading be? And then part B says, what will the pilot's ground speed? What does that mean? That means the velocity relative to the ground. So, in other words, if you were on the ground looking up, you would see the plane flying due north. If you're in Memphis, you'd see that plane on a heading right to Chicago. But in actuality, the plane's going to be pointed in some angle, and the wind's going to keep it going straight. So how is this going to work? All right, let's look at what we're given. So we don't know which way the pilot is going to point the plane, but we know that the velocity of the plane relative to the air is 200 kilometers per hour. That was given. So whichever way the plane is pointing, it's going to go 200 kilometers per hour in that direction. And then the wind is going to push it and give it some velocity in another direction. And we need to figure out what the total velocity is. Now, we know the magnitude of the velocity of the plane with respect to air, but we don't know what direction it's going to be. The velocity of the plane relative to the ground, we know it's going to go due north. That's the heading that the pilot wants to maintain, but we don't know how fast it's going to be going. And then, of course, the air is traveling 50 kilometers per hour from the west to the east. And so we need to figure out how are we going to draw the picture that lets us solve for the two things that are unknown. So let's look at our train analogy that we have. We know that we can write down the equation for a ball thrown from a train so that the ball relative to the ground, the velocity of the ball relative to the ground, is going to be the velocity of the ball relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the ground. Now, I think it's pretty obvious that the ground is the ground. That's not hard to figure out. Is it clear that the plane is like the ball and the air is like the train? The air is moving. The coordinate system that's tied to the air is going to move with it. And so that's going to be like the train. The plane is like the ball. And so if I replace the B with a P and I replace the T with an A, I can write down an equation for my problem. And what it says is the velocity of the plane relative to the ground is the velocity of the plane relative to the air plus the velocity of the air relative to the ground. Now, however you come up with it, if you can just kind of see it in your head how to draw the picture, if just coming up with this equation makes sense to you, or if you need this analogy to help you out, whatever helps you get it. But once you have this, this equation here, that tells you how to draw the triangle. I'm going to take this vector AG, and I want to add it to this vector. We don't know which way it points, but if I add it to this vector, I'm going to end up with this one. And so what I know is that I can think of this as doing tail to tip twice, and I can kind of do it a little bit backwards. If I take this guy here and connect it so that his tip ends up there, because we're trying to draw tail to tip twice here, so I'm just going to take that guy there, and that's going to be the velocity of the air with respect to the ground. And then I know that make the first tail to tip, I'm going to start here and go there. And that vector, that has to be the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. So how did I know to draw that picture? I'm just following this equation. Look what I have. I've got the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. That's the one I've drawn in blue here, plus the velocity of the air with respect to the ground. That's this guy. It equals what we want, the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground. Now we can look at the picture. We have the velocity of the plane relative to the air plus the velocity of the air relative to the ground. That's these two guys. They're going to be equal to the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. And there's going to be some angle here that I'm going to call theta. And so that theta is going to be the direction that the pilot needs to put the plane at. So here's basically what happens. The pilot is sending sets off at 200 kilometers per hour in this direction. But then the wind is going to be 
pushing him back so that he maintains this northward trajectory. Now, this is 200 kilometers per hour. We know this is part of a triangle, and this would be the hypotenuse, so this is some number less than 200 kilometers per hour. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the speed with which it's going overhead. In other words, this is the velocity relative to the ground. A person on the ground looking up at the plane as it flies overhead would measure this speed. The pilot would measure this speed relative to the air that he's flying through. And so the ground speed and the air speed are two very different things. Now, of course, this is the speed of the air, the blowing of the wind. So here's what I've done, and this is a little bit, this is the one thing that's a little bit tricky about here. I've got this vector equation, and we've got the velocity here is equal to these two added together. And then down below, I've got everything is like squared. But look at it. It's not exactly the same thing. This is not vp slash g. This is vp slash a. What have I done here? Once I've drawn the triangle, I don't have to worry about the vectors anymore. I've just got a triangle. And so when I have a triangle, I know this side squared plus that side squared equals the hypotenuse squared. That's the Pythagoras' theorem. And that's what I've done right here. Because I'm trying to solve for this guy. I know this length. I know that length. I can use the Pythagoras theorem to find this one. And so this is hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the legs of the triangle. And I'm solving for this guy here on the right side of the equal sign. And so I'm going to move this guy over here and it becomes negative. And then I take the square root. And so when I do that, this is the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. It's 200 squared minus 50 squared. Of course, we know this side is going to be smaller than the hypotenuse. So it makes sense that we're subtracting here. And when I do all of that, I get the speed of the plane relative to the ground it's 193 kilometers per hour. Now, how do I get the angle? I can use arc tangent. I can use arc cosine. I can use arc sine. Normally, we use the arc tangent, and we have the opposite, I'm sorry, the opposite and the adjacent side of the angles. But here, the sides that we actually know, you know, we've calculated this. There's going to be maybe some calculation error here. We're given the 200, which is the hypotenuse. We're given the 50, which is the opposite. So I used the arc sine as likely to be the most accurate. And so theta is going to be the arc sine of the opposite over the hypotenuse. This is the opposite side, which is 50, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 200. I take the arc sine of that, and I get 14.5 degrees. Now, what is the direction of that angle? If I look at my northwest, east, south little ordinal compass points here, I can see that if I line it up with the north axis, my angle is rotating down in the westward direction. So this would be 14.5 degrees west of north. So that is where we would want to have uh, the, the plane pointed. We would want to point it to 14.5 degrees west of north, and then the wind would drag it back and it would keep it at this trajectory. And that's all there is to that one. So again, all of these problems, they come down to figuring out how to draw the correct triangle. And so once you've got the triangle, it's just a geometry problem. And so you have to figure out what the relationship between those velocity vectors are. Now, sometimes if you can just read the problem and figure it out, do that. But if you're a little bit unsure, use this analogy. Think about it. What's like the ball? What's the one that has the coordinate system that's moving with it? That's the one that's like the train. And once you can figure that out, you can write down the correct equation, draw the triangle. The equation tells you what triangle to draw. Tail the tip twice. Then you got all you need to solve the problem. Once you got that, that triangle, the rest is just easy. All right, this is one of my favorite examples on this topic. And for years, I would often ask a problem similar to this on a test. And before I used to teach this analogy approach, my students really struggled with this problem. Something about it just seems really confusing to a lot of people. I would tell them that this problem was going to be on the test, and they would still struggle with it. 
And so I think there's something that's really tricky about it. But if you use the analogy, it becomes so easy to do. So this is an example where maybe using that analogy would really save you a lot of frustration and a lot of work. So let's see how that works. The problem says two cars travel at a right angle to each other as shown around a corner. And so car two is going to the right, car one is going straight up, and so they're traveling at a right angle to one another. Each car has a velocity relative to the Earth of 40 kilometers per hour. And by the way, notice a lot of these problems I have kilometers per hour. Normally I like to convert things to meters per second, but I don't have any accelerations, I don't have any distances in any of these problems. There's no reason to convert the units, and so I'm just going to leave everything as kilometers per hour. The reason we convert is because we don't want the velocities to be in kilometers per hour and the accelerations to be in meters per second. We have to have everything be in the same units. And so if there's no reason to convert, don't spend time doing that. It just is not going to help you. But anyway, let's look at the problem. The question says, what is the velocity of car one, that's the velocity of this car, with respect to car two? That means we want to find the velocity of car one relative to a coordinate system that's moving with car two. And we have a coordinate system out here that's the Earth coordinate system, and this would be car two coordinate system. And so we want to find the velocity of car one relative to this coordinate system that is moving to the right with car two. So let's look at our analogy again. Um, we have the velocity of the ball relative to the ground is the velocity of the ball relative to the train plus the train to the ground. And remember, I said this is what you need to be able to come up with. We have that simple problem that we looked at at the very beginning of this video, and this is the relationship you need to be able to come up with. After that, it's just a matter of figuring out what's like the train and what's like the ball. And we already said that we have coordinate system number two here, and that's moving with car two, and we want to find the velocity of car one relative to that moving coordinate system. That means that car one is like the ball, and car two must be like the train. And they, in the problem, it says relative to the earth. Obviously, the earth is the same thing as the ground in this case. So all I need to do is make these substitutions. Everywhere I have a B for ball, I put in a one, Everywhere I have a T for train, I put in a 2. Everywhere I have a G for ground, I'm going to put in an E. And that gives me the equation for this. We have V1 slash E. That's the velocity of car 1 relative to the earth is the velocity of car 1 relative to car 2 plus the velocity of car 2 relative to the earth. That's the equation that will let us draw the picture that we can use to solve the problem. Now, before I go to the next slide, it's worth noting what I'm looking for is this guy. The problem said, find the velocity of car 1 relative to car 2. So what I need to do is solve for him. So I've rewritten the equation up here. And don't look at the pictures yet. Let's just look at the equations for just a moment. I've got V1 slash E is V1 slash 2 plus V2 slash E. That's the equation we just came up with. And what we want is we want to solve for this guy. And so if I take this guy over here and move him over to the other side of the equation, I've then solved for this guy V12, which is what I'm looking for. And it says to, to find V1 slash 2, I take V1 slash E and subtract from it V2 slash E. So all I have to do is take these two vectors and subtract them. And that will give me what I want. So I know V2 relative to the Earth is going to the right. V1 relative to the Earth is going up. And so this says do a subtraction of those two vectors. Now, one of the ways we know how to do vector subtraction, the easy way, is to just add a negative. So if V of car 2 relative to the Earth is going to the right, the negative of that vector is going to be going to the left. And so what I want to do is I want to take this vector, this negative v2 slash e, and I want to add it to that vector. And so when I do that, you can see I've done that over in this right-hand corner. v1 slash e plus negative v2 slash e, and then I can do tail to tip twice, 
and I have a nice right triangle, I can use my Pythagorean theorem to find the velocity of one relative to two. And I don't even need to do trig because these are both 40. I know this must be a 45 degree angle because the sides are equal. It's like the sides of a square. And so all I need to do is use the Pythagorean theorem. Now remember, I don't care about the vectors. I don't care about the minus sign. At this point, I've got a triangle that's side 40, side 40, and I just want to find the magnitude. Pythagorean theorem, Bob's your uncle. All right, then. So let's recap what we have. We have, this is the, uh, the original equation that we came up with using our train analogy that helped us determine the relationship between these three velocity vectors. And we said we want to solve for this guy. So we just do simple algebra. We just move this guy over. It becomes negative. And this is what we use to actually draw the triangle to solve for the guy we're looking for. It's all about the triangle. Once you have the triangle drawn, you can easily solve the problem. And so we then drew the triangle, and that's a copy of it over here. And we said all we need to do is do the Pythagorean theorem. And so that's what we're doing. The magnitude of this guy is the square root of the sum of the squares, Pythagoras' theorem. I plug in the 40 and the 40. I square them both and add them together, take the square root, and I get the velocity is 57 kilometers per hour. That would be the velocity of car one as measured from a coordinate system that is moving with car two. And of course, the angle, as we said, is 45 degrees. And if we want to be particular, we could say 45 degrees west of north. Now, there's actually, I've told you previously, 45 degrees west of north, there is another way that we can say that. Do you guys remember what the other way we would say that angle is? If you remember, if it's at 45 degrees, we don't say west of north or east of north or anything like that. If it's a 45 degree angle, we could just say northwest. And so the velocity of the car would, the velocity of car one relative to a coordinate system moving with car two would be 57 kilometers per hour northwest. And I just want to point something out. You know, this, once you've drawn the picture, once you've drawn the picture, this is so easy. Just Pythagoras' theorem. Um, sometimes you need a little trig to find the angle. This problem, as I said at the beginning, conceptually is very difficult for students a lot of the time. It's been my experience that they really struggle with setting it up. But if you use that analogy, what's like the ball, what's like the train, What's like the ground? Use it to set up the equation. That will let you draw the picture. Once you have the picture, it's just a triangle. Or even better than a triangle, it might even just be a straight line. It's going to be one of those two things. And so once you have either your straight line or your triangle, then it's just some basic algebra, very basic algebra, very basic geometry. That's all you need to solve these problems. Now, so far, the examples I have shown you all involve either motion in a straight line or relative motion at a right angle. What if you're not moving at a right angle? What if you're moving at some other angle? It turns out it's slightly harder to do mathematically, but not by a lot. And the procedure is exactly the same. You set up a triangle and you use the basic geometry and trigonometry and algebra that you know to solve for the unknown things in that triangle. Let's look at an example of this. So here, this is a very similar problem, but instead of the wind going to the east, the wind is going at this upward angle. And so how is this going to affect everything if I have a wind going at this upward angle? So the example says, an airplane is heading due south at 191 meters per second. Okay, not kilometers per hour this time, we're actually doing meters per second. When it encounters a 24 meter per second wind from the southwest, and so you can see the winds from the southwest, which would be this way, and so it must be going to the northeast. And the, we know that's going to be at a 45 degree angle. So we have 24 meters per second at a 45 degree angle. And the question says, if the pilot makes no correction, what will the plane's velocity, 
And of course, that means there's a magnitude and a direction because velocity is a vector. What will the plane's velocity be relative to the ground? And so this is where the pilot doesn't make a correction. So here we have, again, for the wind, we're going to use the air. And so we have the velocity of the plane relative to the air is going to be 191 meters per second. And the velocity of the air relative to the ground is going to be 24 meters per second. And what I want you guys to do is pause this video. Please do. It's okay if you get it wrong. You know, making mistakes is what's going to help you learn it. I want you to pause the video and see if you can figure out how to draw the correct triangle uh, for all three vectors. And so the one that you don't have is the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. So how would you draw that? And how would you connect these three together to make the triangle? And again, think about it. If you can't just see how to do it, use that analogy. What's like the train? What's like the ball? And what's like the ground? And that'll let you set up the equation to draw the correct triangle. So pause the video, please. Pause it right now and just try it. Just try it on your own before you do anything else. Let's see if you're getting this idea down. And don't look ahead at the next slides in the PowerPoint because that'll give away the answer. But it's okay to look back at the previous examples if, you, if that will help you. Um, please do this as an exercise before you go on. It'll really help you if you work through this. If you just watch me showing you how to do stuff, you're not going to learn as much. But if you actually sit down and try to figure it out, even if you get it wrong, the fact that your brain is working and trying to figure it out, it'll help you remember it when you see the correct way to do it. So pause the video now and see if you can just, all I'm asking is draw the triangle. I'm not asking you to solve the whole problem, just which way would the three vectors point and how would you connect them together in a triangle? Give it a shot. All right, let's look at this, and if, you, if you're stuck on it, let, let me give you a hint. This is our ball and train equation, and of course we know those are all vectors. What's like the ball? What's like the train? And what's like the ground? Hopefully it's pretty obvious that the ground is like the ground. Is it obvious that the air is like the train? The air is moving, the wind is moving, and so if we have a coordinate system, if we're, if we're measuring things relative to the air, the air is moving, so that's going to be like the train, which was moving. And so that is our uh, air analogy, and then the ball is obviously going to be like the plane. And so write down an equation, but wherever you have a B, put a P, wherever you have a T, put an A, the ground is going to be the same, and Write down that equation, look at tail to tip twice, and see if that shows you how to draw the vectors. If you didn't have it, if you've already got it, you can go on. But if you got stuck, try now. See if this will help you out, and let's just see if we can work through this together. Pause the video again, try to draw the picture, and then we'll see how to do it on the next slide. Have you paused the video? Are you going to really try? Please do. Please do. It'll really help you, I promise. Okay, here we are. Uh, for now, you can ignore all these equations on the left. Let's just look at the picture. Hopefully, you got that the plane was like the ball, and so the velocity of the plane like the is, sorry, the velocity of the plane relative to the ground is the velocity of the plane relative to the air plus the velocity of the air relative to the ground. And so that tells us how to draw the equation. And so what I know is that the velocity of the plane with respect to the air, the pilot is aiming the plane straight down, and we're told that the airspeed is 191 meters per second. The wind is going 45 degrees to the northeast, and so we're told that that is 24 meters per second. And now we have a triangle here. Now you have to be a little bit careful it might look a little bit like a right triangle, but it's actually not a right triangle. And so what does that mean? If it's not a right triangle, you cannot use your trig relationships. Your sine is opposite over hypotenuse. All that stuff requires that you're dealing with right triangles. So none of that applies here. So what can we do? 
Well, what we've been doing in the other examples is we've been using tail to tip twice, and we've been drawing our triangles, and we've been looking at our triangles and saying, oh, we have this right triangle, we can use all the geometry we know, Pythagoras' theorem, and all that stuff. Here we don't have a right triangle. So what can we do? Well, there's a number of things that we could do, but one of the easy things that we can do is simply do vector addition, but do it algebraically. And so what does that mean? It means I can take all these vectors that I'm given, the uh, down one, one that's the 191, the one that's a 45 degree angle that's 24, and I can break all of these guys into X and Y components. Now, let me just be clear that this 24 meter per second one, it's at a 45 degree angle. And so this guy, if this is 45 degrees, this would be 24 cosine of 45, which is equal to 17. And then the vertical one would also be, uh, it would be 24 sine of 45, which is also equal to 17. And so what I've got here is I've got my vectors here. What do I know about V, P slash A? That's the plane relative to the air. I know that it's pointing straight down. So I can write that as a vector as minus 191 meters per second y hat, or 191 meters per second in the negative y hat direction. This, what, this other vector that is uh, the air with respect to the ground that's 24 meters per second at 45 degrees, I know it's going to have a 17 meter per second velocity in the x hat, that's its x component, and it's going to have a 17 meter per second uh, component in the y direction. Now I can take these two vectors, this guy and that guy, and I can add them together. And so this guy has no x component, and this guy has a y component that's negative 191. This guy has both x and y components. When I simply do the arithmetic of adding these vectors together, again, I get the x parts, I add up all the x parts, I get the y parts, I add up all the y parts. You know how to do this. This is just regular vector addition. I end up with the velocity of the plane relative to the ground being 17 meters per second in the x hat direction and 174 meters per second in the negative y hat direction. Now let's look at the picture here. Does that answer makes sense. It basically says go over a little bit to the right and then go down a bunch. And so this is basically um, what we would expect. Now, I didn't draw this exactly to scale because I didn't need to draw it exactly to scale. I just rough sketched it. If I was doing it exactly to scale, this guy would be about 10 times as long as that guy. Uh, I didn't. It didn't work out that way. But... Uh, it's good enough for government work, and you can kind of see what it's going to look like. Now, on a test, if I asked for this velocity and you told me that this was the velocity, I'd be perfectly happy with it because that is the velocity. But what if we want the speed? How fast is it going speed? Well, we know we can simply take this guy and draw the regular right triangle. This is the x and y, which are perpendicular. So I've done this here. This guy would be the 17, and this guy would be the 174. And so what we have is that this guy squared is equal to the 17 squared plus the 174 squared. Take the square root. And I get the velocity of the plane relative to the ground is about 175 meters per second. And the angle it makes, phi, is about 84.4 degrees. Now, we need to be really careful. What is that angle phi? The angle phi that I'm talking about would be this angle here. That's my phi. And that's the angle made with this triangle here. It's not the angle made with the triangle above. And typically in the problem, if you're asked for this on a homework, um, you may not want the angle phi. You probably want the angle theta, which is in here. But if I draw a straight down here, 
can you see that that would be my angle theta? And so it's just phi subtracted from 90 degrees, and that'll give you what's left over is theta. And so if I say theta is equal to 90 degrees minus phi, that gives me theta is 5.6 degrees. And that would be the angle here. And so this pilot tries to fly straight south, but because of this northeastward wind, he's blown off course. And so he's going to actually be flying 5.6 degrees. And how would we say that? I would say that as east of south. And I would let that be my direction. And he would be flying at a speed of 175 meters per second, 5.6 degrees east of south. Now, we're going to do one last problem, and we're actually going to continue the same problem we were just working on. So in the previous example, the pilot tried to fly due south, but there was a wind that blew him off course. What would the pilot need to do to correct for the wind? In other words, what angle should the pilot point his plane at so that instead of being blown off course, he maintains that due south trajectory? And if he does fly at that angle, he'll, that'll be his velocity relative to the air at that angle. What will be his velocity relative to the ground? So again, this is what we know. We know the velocity of the plane relative to the ground is straight down. We know the velocity of the air relative to the ground is at a 45 degree angle. We know the velocity of the plane with respect to the air has a magnitude of 191 meters per second. We know the velocity of the air with respect to the ground has a magnitude of 24 meters per second, and that's at 45 degrees. And so we're going to be looking for what angle should the pilot turn the plane, and then once you have used that to figure out how to draw the triangle, let's figure out what the ground speed is. That's the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. So again, we have our equation here. It's the same equation that we had before, actually. The velocity of the plane relative to the ground is the velocity of the plane relative to the air plus the velocity of the air relative to the ground. Once we have that equation, that tells us how to draw the picture. Now, what do we have? We've got the velocity of the air relative to the ground. We've got the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. These are the two vectors that we know how they are. Which way will this other guy point? Now, there's two ways we can figure this out. We can simply look at the picture and arrange the vectors. We know that this guy over here, the tip of this guy has to end up at the tip of that guy when you're done because that's going to be this guy is your vector sum. That's the one you're gonna that's the second tail to tip twice. So it's gotta end up at the tip of this guy. And so I can scoot this guy down here. But if you didn't see that, I've already shown you another way you can you can solve for an unknown. I can algebraically solve for this guy and it would tell me to subtract this guy from that guy. You can do it either way. Either way will show you how to draw the triangle. So I want you guys, again, I want you to pause the video. Please do. Use this equation. Use these two vectors. See if you can figure out how to add these guys together. So this guy is the black one. This guy is the red one. And so we're trying to figure out what this guy is going to look like. Use, these equa use this equation to show you how to draw the picture. Please pause the video and try to draw the triangle. Just do it. If you do it, it will help you so much. Even if you get it wrong, when you see how I actually do it and you go back and think it through, it will help you so much. So please pause the video. Please, please pause the video. Give it a shot. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to take this red vector here 
and I'm going to redraw it so that the tips of these two vectors line up because I know this black vector is the second vector from the tail to tip twice. And so this is my V A slash G here. And then I'm going to draw from the tail of this guy down here, and that creates my tail to tip twice. And this would be the unknown one. This is the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. That's this guy, the one that I'm looking for. Now, it's pretty easy for me to see how to, to set this triangle up just because I've been doing all this vector stuff for so long. If you don't look at this equation and say, oh, this is how I have to arrange it, make it easy for yourself. Let's do the subtraction. This is another way that we could do it. I can say that VP slash A, that's the one I'm trying to figure out how to draw that one. I've got the other two. I know what the other two look like. VP slash A is going to look like VP slash G minus VA slash G. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take VP slash G, I'm going to redraw it over here. I'm trying to keep the same length in the same direction, you know, more or less. Now, I'm going to take this VA slash G and subtract it. And we know that that means that I'm going to reverse its direction. And so this is minus VA slash G. And now I can draw this vector difference just adding the negative, and that would give me my VP slash A. Either way that you do it, whichever way makes the most sense to you, that has let you draw the triangle. That's the triangle that you need to solve this problem. Now again, this is not a right triangle. This is a triangle that you cannot use your normal trig functions on. So what can you do? You can do exactly what we did in the last problem. We can break all these vectors that we know down into x and y components. But there's actually another alternative that in some cases is a little bit easier to do. And I just want to show you a different way to do it so that you'll have this technique in your bag of tricks. So here is our triangle that we've drawn. We want to find this angle here, and we want to find the magnitude of this purple guy. We could actually try to break these guys into x and y components, and we've already seen how to break this guy into x and y components, but we'd also have to break this purple guy into x and y components, and we don't know what this angle is ahead of time, so we'd have to be really clever. We'd have to use this distance here and that distance there, and it gets tricky trying to, to do it vector, do it with vector components. There's an easier way. And we can use the law of sines and the law of cosines. And this is a definitely a tool that you should have in your bag of tricks for any time you encounter a triangle that is not a right triangle. And so I have it in my head. Anytime I see a triangle that's not a right triangle, I think immediately law of sines, law of cosines. Because those work with any triangle, even ones that are not right triangles. So just real quick, I want to review the law of sines and the law of cosines. So what I have is a triangle that's not a right triangle. It'll work for right triangles too, but you don't need to use it for right triangles. It's overkill. Um, I've got three angles. I've got an angle A, little a, angle little b, and angle little c. And what do I know about those three angles? One thing I know is they better add up to 180 degrees because the interior angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. Another thing I know about this triangle is that it's going to have sides, and I've labeled the sides with the same letter as the opposite angle. So here's little c, it's a side of length capital C. Here's angle little b, it's opposite of side capital B, and so on. The law of sines tells me that if I take any angle and I take its sine, and then I divide it by the length of the opposite side, that number is going to be constant for all the sides and angles of the triangle. In other words, if I take the sine of little c divided by the length c, that's going to be equal to the sine of little b divided by its opposite length, big B. 
or the sine of angle A divided by its opposite length, capital A. These are all going to equal each other. The sine of little c over big C equals the sine of little b over big B equals the sine of little a over big A. That's the law of sines. The law of cosines says the side that you're trying to find, and I could have picked B, I could have picked A, it doesn't matter. I just pick C because that's what usually people pick. The, the length of side C squared is the length of side A squared plus the length of side B squared. That looks just like the Pythagorean theorem, except then you subtract from it 2AB times the cosine of the opposite angle. And if I was solving for b, I'd use the cosine a little b, because that's the opposite angle. But it's the same pattern. And so the side squared you're looking for is the sum of the squares of the other two sides minus 2ab, the, the, two, the two known sides, times the cosine of the opposite angle. This is the law of cosines. If you know some of the sides and or some of the angles in a triangle, you can almost always use these guys to figure out all the other sides and all the other angles. And so I just want to show you that we can work that other problem using this instead of worrying how to break it down into vector components. Now we can apply the law of sines and the law of cosines to our triangle that we've been working with. And of course, we know we're looking for this angle here, which we'll call theta. And we're looking for the side of VPG. We want to know what this corrected velocity is. And so we know that this purple vector, this is the plane relative to the air. And we were given in the problem that that had a speed of 191 meters per second. And we also were told that the air with respect to the ground was 24 meters per second. And so we want to find this opposite side here, VPG, and we want to find this angle, theta. So we know the theta is opposite this 24, and we know that this side is 191, and it's going to be opposite this angle. Now, how much is that angle? Well, we know this is a 45-degree angle, and so there, this red line is going to make a 45-degree angle with that horizontal and then that's going to be a 90 degree angle, add them together, that makes 135 degrees at that corner. And so this angle is 135 degrees, which is opposite the 191. The angle theta we want is opposite the 24. So we can use the law of sines. We can say that the sine of 135 over 191 equals the sine of this unknown angle theta divided by its opposite side, 24. And when we solve for theta, we get 5.1 degrees. Now we can take that 5.1 degrees and add it to the 135 degrees here and subtract that from 180 because there's 180 degrees. All the angles of the triangle have to add up to be 180. And so that tells us that this angle is going to be 39.9 degrees, about 40 degrees. And so now I can take that and I can plug it into the law of cosines because I know if this angle is 39.9, I know the length of this side, I know the length of that side. I can now find this unknown side using the law of cosines, and I can say that this squared is equal to 191 squared plus 24 squared minus 2. That's 2AB cosine of theta. That's 2 times 91 times 24 times the cosine of 39. I was a little sloppy here. I didn't include my units just because this equation was so long. I was having trouble getting it to all fit on my screen, so I just left the units off for now. But when you solve for the velocity of the plane relative to the ground, you find that it is 173 meters per second, and it's going to be at an angle of 5.1 degrees. Now, this vertical line here is pointing to the south. Can you tell me what that angle is going to be? Hopefully you recognize that that's going to be to the west of south. And so this angle is to the west of the south, 510 degrees. And here we have our speed, and that's the problem solved.